All right, so I'm very happy to introduce Kelsey Moody from uh, um, ICOR Biosciences. They're one of our sponsors, and we are extremely grateful that they chose to support our meeting. So, Kelsey, whenever you are ready, you can start. All righty. Well, thank you all for uh, coming back after dinner, and we just have a short period of time until open bar, which I'm sure you're all excited about as well. Uh, my name is Kelsey Moody, and I'm the uh, founder and CEO at iCore Life Sciences. Um, I'm also the uh, CEO at uh, LysoClear, which is one of our portfolio companies, which I'll be discussing a little bit today. Um, before I dive in, um, I'm basically one of those evil uh, corporate tyrant types, so assume that everything I do has some sort of financial uh, vested interest in, uh, including the data I'll be presenting today. And um, on our agenda, to kind of kick things off, um, I want to make the case for uh, the eye as kind of the organ system of choice when translating an actual uh, longevity therapeutic. And we're going to use our portfolio company, LysoClear, to kind of illustrate this and walk through an overview of our target indication, age-related macular degeneration. I'm going to discuss a little bit about some of the early work in the space, um, and then the current status of our research uh, developing an enzyme augmentation therapy for this disease. So uh, the case for the eye, um, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons why I like using the eye uh, as a, a starting point for an actual uh, aging uh, focused program. And, and the first reason is, uh, if we look at all the hallmarks of aging, any hallmark of aging that truly is a hallmark of aging and exists throughout the body uh, should manifest in some sort of ocular pathology as well. And there's a lot of uh, pragmatic reasons that doing therapeutic development in uh, the eye makes a lot of sense. Uh, when I think about drug development, I think about first pass effect with the liver, I think about my kidneys peeing out all of my product, and that doesn't help. Um, whereas in the eye, you know, you have the vitreous humor, it, it turns over relatively slowly, um, and, and, and so in many aspects it can act as kind of a natural reservoir uh, for releasing uh, your API. Additionally, the eye is immune privileged. So when I think about uh, emerging uh, therapeutic modalities, different gene therapies, uh, different cell therapies, um, it makes sense, particularly for the first generation of these products, it might make sense to, uh, to work with those uh, in an immune privileged area. Likewise, efficacy is pretty easy to measure in the eye. Uh, we can do fundus imaging, which is non-invasive, uh, to look at the macroscopic characteristics of the eye. Uh, we can do techniques like optical coherence tomography to get structural information about, say, the posterior eye segment. Um, and we can also do functional assessments of visual acuity, again, all of which are non-invasive um, and, and uh, to a large extent are quantitative. And then finally, one of the most boring topics to discuss in drug development is manufacturing of your API. But for many products, in particular gene and cell therapies, um, working in the eye means that you require a lot less product in order to do your proof of concept studies uh, because eyes are very tiny and again, you don't have uh, the first pass effects and immune issues and so forth uh, that you might encounter with a, uh, with a systemic administration. And so at ICOR, our goal is to uh, start all of our programs when possible in some sort of ocular indication uh, and then move those programs into systemic applications down the road, uh, as we'll see shortly. And uh, it, it's not surprising, perhaps, that other companies uh, have adopted this as a strategy too, right? Um, lineage cell therapeutics, uh, developing RPE cells for uh, age-related macular degeneration, and Unity now is in the clinic uh, looking at uh, senolytics uh, with ocular indications. And so I uh, just have a brief overview of i proper. Um, so uh, i Life Sciences is kind of the ecosystem. Uh, we do preclinical through clinical contract research. Um, and then we have a venture arm that's entirely focused on aging and age-related disease. And kind of our objective is if we look at the different hallmarks of aging, um, we don't think that there's going to be a magic super pill that's going to cure aging. So as we're developing assets within our portfolio, our objective really is to develop a whole portfolio of assets that are able to uh, systematically attack different hallmarks of aging. And that's kind of what we're focused on as an organization. 
Uh, but for the purposes of today's conversation, I'm going to focus on just one of our portfolio companies, uh, Lysoclear, um, which we founded uh, some years ago and again focused on age-related macular degeneration. So uh, age-related macular degeneration itself is the leading cause of vision loss uh, in the elderly. It's characterized by the loss of uh, your central vision, so that high acuity vision that allows you to interact with your environment. And if you think about an aging population where individuals might have reduced mobility, uh, they might have hearing loss, imagine if you lose your eyesight on top of that. That can be incredibly debilitating for these patients. Um, and so we want to try to do something about that. Now, in terms of the pathophysiology of the disease, uh, vision comes from uh, the back part of the eye, an area called the retina. And uh, you might know if my works, no, maybe not. Okay, a little indentation on the back of the eye called the macula. Uh, this is the specific part of the posterior eye segment that gives you that high acuity central vision. Uh, and that's where we see um, the uh, disease manifest. If we take a little bit deeper of a dive into the microanatomy, uh, we'll appreciate that there's a lot of different layers between the center of the eye, the vitreous, and the posterior uh, part of the eye where the retinal pigmented epithelial cells, or RPE, reside. And uh, ah, I pressed the wrong button. Um, uh, the, uh, the primary uh, cell type that we're interested in macular degeneration are these guys in the back, the RPE, or retinal pigmented epithelial cells. And as a general rule in biology, when things get hit by light, it tends to be very damaging. So as our photoreceptors get hit by light and allow us to see, the RPE cells are constantly gobbling up those photoreceptor outer segments to maintain healthy metabolism and physiology of the eye. And as a byproduct of this kind of phagocytic process, the RPE cells have intracellular lipofuscin that starts to accumulate. We all have lipofuscin accumulating in our RPE cells right now. And it's not for a while until uh, those uh, accumulations start to become pathologic. Um, the first thing that happens as the cells become increasingly stressed from intracellular lipofuscin is they dump their intracellular contents. And we can see that uh, by way of fundus imaging, these little white specks. Uh, this is extracellular junk that the RPE cells have dumped. And we call that drusen. If we take a cross-section of the eye measured by optical coherence tomography, that's what this is up top, uh, we can see these bulges directly below the RPE layer. So again, this is where the RPE cells are dumping that intracellular content. Now importantly, in this early stage of the disease, you know, you go to a, a physician, they're going to be able to see this very easy on uh, fundus examination, but the, uh, the, the concave uh, architecture of the macula is still intact. All of our different photoreceptor layers and RPE layers are perfectly intact. So as a patient, uh, we don't experience or we wouldn't notice any sort of clinical manifestation of symptoms. But as the junk continues to accumulate, the RPE cells start to die, as do the photoreceptors that rely upon them. We have geographic atrophy, and this is where patients start to experience uh, progressive vision loss. As a general rule, um, when cells are dying, everything's unhappy. So we have hypoxia, complement activation, inflammation, all kinds of bad things that, among other things, can lead to new blood vessel formation. And the new blood vessels uh, can hemorrhage into the eye or lead to uh, secondary effects like retinal detachment, as illustrated here. Uh, this can lead to complete blindness uh, very quickly for these patients. So our disease hypothesis is that lipofuscin, junk inside of the cells, drives the accumulation of drusen, junk outside of the cells, does a bunch of bad things, and causes the disease. And our goal at Lysoclear is to eliminate that intracellular lipofuscin uh, and preserve uh, healthy, uh, uh, healthy uh, anatomy of the eye uh, and prevent the disease from occurring. So early work uh, was really based on this idea that maybe we can identify enzymes that are capable of breaking down intracellular lipofuscin and develop them therapeutically for this disease. Uh, this is uh, an idea that was put forth by Aubrey de Grey some years ago. Um, and SENS Research Foundation uh, did a bunch of work early on identifying a class of fungal peroxidases that were able to degrade lipofuscin in cell-free assays. And uh, they eventually went on to other things, never really took these enzymes and moved them into uh, cell or in vivo testing. Um, and that's the time that uh, i started working on this project. 
Um, I was in medical school in Syracuse, New York at the time. I had an awesome living room that we set up to solve all kinds of uh, biotechnology issues. Um, if you actually want to start a living room laboratory, uh, we did publish a paper on how to do this, but I digress. And in the living room, uh, we uh, recombinantly expressed manganese peroxidase, and, uh, which was one of the lead enzymes identified by Sense Foundation. Uh, and we showed that this particular enzyme efficiently degrades lipofuscin uh, in sulfur assays, in vitro, and in vivo. So the graph on the left, uh, lipofuscin, like all lipofuscin throughout the body, is comprised of a lot of different chemical species. The primary offenders in ocular lipofuscin are bisretinoids. So we synthesized all of the major bisretinoid species and showed that manganese peroxidase efficiently degrades all of them. The hardest to degrade species is called A2E, so we use that as a primary readout for all of our future assays, the idea being that any efficacy we saw against A2E uh, would underrepresent the effectiveness of our, of our enzymes. Um, we did cell models where untreated you know, cells are happy, lots of A2E, they get very sad, we can partially rescue that with enzyme therapy, and the enzyme itself uh, is non-toxic in these cells. And then uh, we were the first group to move into an in vivo model uh, using the ABCA4 null mouse model, uh, which is a model of dry AMD and Stargardt's disease, um, and showed that we were able to eliminate intra, uh, uh, intraocular lipofuscin in vivo as well. We were really excited because we thought we had a clinical candidate we could move forward with, um, and then reality hit us. Uh, the delivery mechanism through which the manganese peroxidase is supposed to get into the cells is through uh, mannose receptor endocytosis. Uh, so these enzymes have N-link uh, mannose sugars, um, and that's the mechanism by which the proteins can properly fold and function, but also how we get them into the target cells. And uh, the sugar chains, as they're added, is kind of like if you just have a tree that grows randomly. It's very hard to control the branching patterns um, of the sugars. Uh, so for that reason, we weren't able to move forward with manganese peroxidase as a therapeutic lead. Um, fortunately, uh, we weren't still in the living room at that point. Um, i Life Sciences now occupies three commercial facilities all across New York. Uh, we've got 60 employees and we're re really well equipped to handle full drug discovery programs. And uh, using the manganese peroxidase uh, work as uh, kind of a starting point, we did a ton of mechanistic work that I don't have time to go into today, unfortunately. Um, but we determined that manganese peroxidase breaks down lipofuscin bisretinoids uh, through heme-mediated oxidation. And so we went back and started scouting for new enzymes uh, based on uh, what we believe is the mechanism for MNP. And our selection criteria was as follows. Uh, we wanted to have enzymes that had sufficient redox potential to break down uh, the A2E and the other lipofuscin components. Uh, because of the manufacturing and CMC issues we faced with manganese peroxidase, we wanted enzymes that had known potential for bacterial production, so they're not dependent on uh, chaperone proteins and complex folding and so forth uh, that we see with, say, the fungal peroxidases. And because we want these enzymes to work in lysosomes, uh, we also wanted to select source species that had optimal growth at an acidic pH. So uh, we scoured the literature for all manner of uh, different enzymes that we could potentially go after. And uh, we chose a, a medley of 28 unique enzymes from very diverse species uh, in our screening cascade. For each one of these 28 enzymes, uh, we started with small-scale pilot expression, so shaker flask, moved into bioreactor expression uh, for gross yield determination. We then went through our purification cascade, so not just purity, but also homogeneity of the products. Uh, were they aggregation prone, bioactivity to determine pure yields? Um, this was also a really interesting part uh, that we got into uh, protein engineering. Uh, we found, um, for some reason or another, a lot of these uh, bacterial enzymes um, had surface cysteines that weren't really required for the proper folding of the enzyme or for any aspect of its function. Um, but when we concentrated the enzyme for use in, say, ocular delivery, um, that would lead to aggregation um, and, and so forth. So we were able to mutate out uh, a lot of those surface cysteines, so that was great for IP extension and to uh, make a less aggregation-prone product. And uh, collectively, uh, every single one of these enzymes that we were capable of manufacturing uh, efficiently degraded lipofuscin fluorophores in cell-free, cell-based, uh, and in vivo assays. 
I've got data from just a few of the enzymes that we expressed here. Um, we'll note for uh, cell-free uh, degradation, uh, BSA and manganese peroxidase, we have several enzymes that have pretty similar uh, degradation as compared to the manganese peroxidase. Um, but what was also interesting to us is uh, we're looking at pH of 5 in black and pH of 7.4 um, in red. Um, all of these enzymes were preferentially active at the acidic pH of a lysosome and less so at physiologic pH, which is a highly desirable feature for a, a clinical lead. We, of course, showed that these enzymes uh, degraded lipofuscin in uh, cells um, and then also saw a very significant elimination of uh, lipofuscin as measured by A2E in the uh, ABCA4 model. What was also really interesting to us is, you know, these enzymes came from all over the place. And so when we actually looked at the primary sequence homology among the HITs, uh, the, the, the sequence homology was very, very low. But we did see very high tertiary structure homology. So DNA for the proteins, completely different, but the structures were actually reasonably conserved across all the leads. Um, and we were excited about this because this gave us uh, strong IP positioning, um, a, a large quantity actually of viable leads that would be suitable um, for translational work. Um, and all of this, of course, was mechanistically informed. So uh, where we're at at the moment is uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, what's the best delivery vehicle for these enzymes? All of the proof of concept work that we did uh, utilized, uh, we had done like a 500 cell penetrating peptide screen to identify uh, CPPs that could selectively target RPE cells over other I cells. Um, that was really good for our proof of concept work, but didn't pan out for developing a drug candidate. Um, so what we settled on um, is uh, um, lipid nanoparticles. Um, so we've entered into a collaboration uh, with a, a company that has deep expertise in lipid nanoparticles. Um, they've given us about uh, 20 uh, or so nanoparticles uh, to do um, screening to uh, optimize for uh, RPE localization. Um, we can see some of the quantified data here. So RPE cells turning green, we're delivering uh, just GFP in this circumstance with lipid nanoparticles. And uh, we've seen at least several nanoparticles that have a uh, high degree of specific uh, specificity for RPE and also very high payload. Um, the lipid nanoparticle screening uh, was actually completed in the last uh, two weeks or so. And uh, now we're doing a little bit more work optimizing lysosomal targeting of the mRNA. So if we deliver mRNA for our enzymes uh, to these cells, uh, we want those enzymes to be optimally expressed and lysosomally targeted so they can function. That work's in progress and will be done in the next couple of weeks or so. Uh, and then our expectation is to move into our pivotal in vivo studies using our ABCA4 model um, by the uh, end of the year with the intent of having a drug uh, candidate that we can move into IND enabling studies sometime in uh, spring 2024. Of course, uh, a lot of different things we do. Uh, this is just one project uh, in one company, in one division of kind of the i ecosystem, um, but we're really excited about it and uh, you know, the uh, applications this could have for patients with macular degeneration. Um, by way of acknowledgments, uh, thank you obviously to all the investors that have supported this work. Uh, we did also receive a grant from National Eye Institute um, and uh, a bunch of people that were instrumental on the project. Um, and uh, with that, I thank you all for your time and I'll uh, field any questions. Thank you so much, Kelsey. That was really awesome. Do we have any questions for Kelsey? Otherwise, I will ask a question. So, Lipofuskin is also involved in everything. Uh, so, it's in, in many tissues, I guess, as we age. Uh, have you thought about uh, going, it's because we don't die from AMD, I guess, but have you thought about other target diseases also? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the components of lipofuscin and other tissues throughout the body um, can be chemically distinct. Um, the uh, workflows that we've put on for identifying therapeutically useful enzymes, screening them and iterating them um, will all translate, we think, to other um, 
other potential targets. Um, we are exploring prospective Lipofuscin targets. Um, the, the hard part with targeting Lipofuscin broadly is it's made up of many, many different things. Um, we have a lot of reasons to think the bisretinoids in the case of macular degeneration are a very uh, good target. Um, other areas of the body we're studying to see you know, what things might be worth going after. All right, well, um, let's give Kelsey another round of applause and uh...